thank you all for having me. Um, I hope Elena said good things about me. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge and say a thank you to a couple people. First of all, Elena, you've been fantastic. Thank you for all your help. Um, the most special person who has made this all possible uh, and has become a friend and a business associate and by the way had some very big news today. I don't know if anybody saw uh, the announcement about consideration for UNESCO today and again I want to give a very warm thank you for all hospitality and making this happen. Boris Tetarov. I have to also acknowledge two other people, uh, or I could be in really big trouble in Los Angeles. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the two co-chairmen and my bosses, Marina and Sergei Bespalov. Okay, uh, I hope everybody understands English. If I speak too fast, Please slow me down. So, I mean, I need to understand a little bit about my audience before I start. So, how many people here are producers? Show of hands. How many people here want to be a producer? Show of hands. How many people want to direct a movie or have directed a movie? Show of hands. Good. How many people want to be a writer or have written? Oh, show of hands, good. How many people want to work behind the camera in some way? Oh, good, we have a very good cross. And how many people are here because they were told they have to come? <laughs> good. Um, that helps me, thank you. And I assume how many here are film, are there any film students in the audience? Good. Okay. So I'm going to make this what I call interactive a bit with the audience. So a second question I have is when I say the word Hollywood, what comes to mind? Money. Who said money? What else comes to mind besides money when I say Hollywood? What else? Didn't hear you. Speak louder. Action. Connections. Audrey Hepburn. What else comes to mind when someone says Hollywood? Does anybody think about glamour? Does anybody think about stars? <laughs> Very good. Those are all, and I guess the most important word that I think of when I think of Hollywood is entertainment. Because that's what Hollywood is all about. Entertainment. Entertaining people. And it's important because there is, the reason it's called, what we refer to it is show business. And the reason people say show business is because it is a business. It's not about glamour. It is, can be, it can be about fun. It can be about stars. It's obviously very, very important money. Uh, but there is something that everyone needs to just understand. There is this tension between art and commerce. And what I mean by that is certain movies get made for art. Certain movies get made, and the movies that I've always been involved in, we make movies for commerce. And it's important to understand that somewhere in between, that there, there, there meets. And there's always a tension of whether or not we want to have a movie that's going to play in film festivals, but that's never going to play in a theater, or we want to have movies that are going to play in theaters and make money. So let's talk a little bit about what, you know, what is, what is filmmaking? What are the main segments of filmmaking? Well, first, there's studios. 
When I say studios, I'm talking about the American studios. Warner Brothers, Fox, Disney. Who am I asking? Warner Brothers, Fox, Disney. And studios, Paramount. Those are the main studios that dominate the film business throughout the world. And they make movies and they're distributed throughout the world. The second part of the business, which is a part of the business that I'm now in, and a number of people are in, is the independent business. Independent films. So what does independent film mean? Independent film means films that are not financed by a studio. And it's a very broad definition, but it's important to understand that films that are not financed or distributed by one of the major studios in Hollywood are independent. And then the third segment of the business is what I call local language productions. And local language productions are French movies in France, Russian movies in Russia, Korean movies in Korea. Now what's important to realize is these local language movies are, are a very, very big segment of the marketplace. So for example, in Korea, the box office probably is dominated between 60 and 70 percent of Korean movies. Japan, at least 50 to 60 percent of movies that work in Japan are Japanese movies. In Russia, CIS, depending upon the year, it can be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent, depending upon the success of a picture. So depending on the territory, every territory has what I call a local language business. So to understand the business a little, it really, it's very, very simple. It may seem complicated, but it's a very, very simple business. There's two primary aspects of the film industry, production and distribution. Now we can all go home. Anyway, production is exactly what it says. It is the making of the movie. Now, it sounds easy, but production has a number of subsets. And production is development of the script, getting the script into a, a, a way, getting the script into shape so that you're ready to make the movie. You're also in production, you're attaching elements. You're attaching a director. You're attaching the cast. That is the production process. And then at some point soon, the movie will start shooting. And that's called the start of principal photography. The second aspect of the business is distribution. And distribution is a broad term. And when I say distribution, I mean distribution in all media. Now, we all think of, most people think of distribution, they think of theatrical. I want to see my movie in a movie theater. I then want to see it on DVD wherever the DVD business is still alive. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So distribution is actually taking the content and taking the movie and putting it through and having it released through its different phases of distribution, whether it's theatrical, whether it's home entertainment. And we'll talk a little bit about the digital world. In fact, let me ask a question. How many people here have downloaded a movie illegally? How many people here have downloaded music illegally? How many people here have stolen a shirt from a store? <laughs> is there a difference? What's happened is somehow intellectual property seems to be different than my shirt, and it's not. Now, What's happened around the world and what's hurting this business around the world is piracy and the illegal downloading of movies. And by the way, my kids are guilty of it as well. Um, even though they know, like when I may ask for, you know, have you, have you heard the new Adele DVD? And literally in four minutes, my son not only has downloaded the, DV, the, the CD, but he's downloaded the artwork. And he goes, here, Dad. 
All right, we're going to talk about this later because this is a very, very important point. And it seems today that people, especially the youth audience, actually feel that they're entitled to do this, and it's wrong. And I don't really know, and I don't have the answers on how this is going to stop, but whether when you're in Korea, where there's amazing broadband penetration, or other Spain, where there's incredible broadband penetration, what's happened in some of these countries is that it has killed the DVD business and it is hurting the TV business. Because I don't know about your kids, but my kids who are 28 and 26, when they want to hear a song or they want to see a movie, they want it now. They don't want to wait. They don't want to wait and have, find out what time the movie starts in a the movie theater. They don't want to wait until they may see it may be on DVD or on iTunes. They want it now. So we are in a world today of immediacy. And it's important to just keep that in mind. So, but is that, is that bad? Is there good news to all of this? Of course there is. And the good news is the actual box office, people going to theaters, which is the most important aspect of a movie sometimes, is, is doing well. America, of course, over $10 billion in box office. And for the first time, the number two country in the world in box office at around $3, million, $3 billion is China. And China is one of the fastest growing countries in the world in terms of box office exposure. Whereas it has served, number three now is Japan with around $2.4 million. And then you have CIS Russia at about $1.2 billion. And so the question then becomes, do all movies work everywhere? The answer is no. Okay. When, we have a, when I know there's a family animated movie, what country just comes to mind? Russia CIS, who love these type of movies. Mexico, of all places, loves family movies. Whereas, and there's certain limitations in every country of the world, for example, Germany, very bad, you cannot have, they're very, very, very fussy about violence. Japan, Malaysia, a Asia, sex is a problem. Be very, very careful in terms of sex. China, censorship. So for example, in China, no movie is released until the censorship board approves it. And to give you an example, for, you cannot show a cop being killed in China. They don't allow it. So you have to understand that not every movie is going to work throughout the world. But that said, there are four primary quadrants that when you're making a movie, you need to think about. And it's male and female under 25, and it's male and female over 25. And there's an expression that's important today. And the expression goes something like this. Make a movie for everyone. Make a movie for someone. Do not make a movie for no one. Who understands what I just said? Yes. What did I, what did I just mean? Who just said that? You're hired. You're 100% correct. That's exactly right. So what studios focus on today are the tentpole movies, the four quadrant movies. Who can name me the most recent four quadrant movies that are in distribution today that are successful? One starts with I, R, Iron Man, Star Trek. Now these movies are studio productions and these movies usually cost upwards of $150 million plus. Now independent movies 
And that is, this, that is the space that the studios are concentrating on. What independent, which is a good time for independent movies, the studios have vacated the call it 20 to 65 million dollars space. And that is the space that now independents can concentrate on. And it's a really good space because you can actually hire A directors and you can hire very, very good cast. So if you don't, if you take anything away today, one word that you should always remember is a tent pole movie. And a tent pole movie is the four quadrant big studio picture that right now the number one movie in the world and which is breaking box office records is Iron Man. And starting right now, probably around May 1, the beginning of May, so far we've had, and Fast and Furious, by the way, 5 was released in America this weekend and throughout the world, did $120 million over the, over the long Memorial Day weekend. This weekend in the United States, we actually had a holiday on Monday, which is very rare. And we, that movie did 120 million, and it was released throughout the world, what's called day and date releasing, and did another 160 million. So what do I mean by day and date releasing and who cares? Day and date releasing means that throughout the world, the movie came out on the same weekend or very, very close to the same weekend. And one of the main reasons for doing that, not only for trying to take all the excitement in one weekend, because as you know, if a movie is released in America and doesn't work, and the release is held off overseas, the chances are the movie may not work overseas because the information flow is so quick that exhibition understands that the movie may not work. So one of the second and most primary reasons for what's called this day and date releasing is piracy. Because piracy is a huge, huge problem still throughout the world. Now, one of the most vibrant box offices today is the CIS Russia. And what's happening there is the English language movies, which by the way, we know um, are dubbed. And it's unusual that the, the, all of the movies in CIS are dubbed. And you would think, why is that? Well, the only countries of the world that dub their movies are France, Italy, Germany, Spain, and Russia. Everywhere else where you see a U.S. movie in English, it's subtitled. Now, what is the one example or one exception to that rule? Anybody can answer that? Who said animation? Exactly. Children's movies are dubbed in every language. And why is that? This is a smart audience. Children cannot read subtitles. Correct. So, on big animated movies, whether it's Pixar or DreamWorks, they could be dubbed into everything from Zulu to Flemish. And they're dubbed in every language throughout the world. So that is, that's the example. Now, let's talk about a little bit about box office. Um, so in America and in most countries of the world, when you wake up on Monday morning or even Sunday night, on the national news and throughout all the internet, everybody is talking about what were the top five movies for the weekend. And you start to think, who cares? Okay, why does somebody really care about what's happening at the box office? The reason is very simple. It's Hollywood. It's glamour. It's stars. And everybody is interested because they want to know what movie they think they should be going to see. Now, when you make a movie and, you're, and it's important for everybody who has a vision, who wants to make a movie, 
You need to think about who is your audience. Because you have to have an audience. Now, what, one of the great considerations and mistakes that people make is that movies get made and they don't find an audience. And it's a common mistake. So there's really two aspects of a movie in, to think about. The first aspect is what I call marketability. marketability. What do I mean by marketability? Marketability is how is a distributor going to bring this movie to the consumer? What is it about this movie that's going to cause somebody, somewhere in the world, because you know, going in the movies is not easy. If you're a family of four, it's a Saturday night, you need to get a babysitter probably. And you need to plan to get a babysitter. And then you need to drive to the theater, you need to park the car, you may go to dinner, you may go to the, you're going to go to the movies, you're going to buy popcorn, you're going to buy candy. So it's an for an average, um, an average person anywhere, going to the movies is expensive. But yet from a value proposition and from an entertainment, it's still relatively cheap. So why am I bringing this up? Because marketability, it's important. What is it about this movie? Is it the trailer you've seen? Is it a review online? Is it something about the artwork that you've seen in the, in the theater? Is it have one of your favorite stars in the movie? Is it a subject matter? Is it a sequel? Is it something, oh, I saw Iron Man two, 1 and 2. I want to see Iron Man 3. I've seen Fast and Furious 1, 2, 3, 4, and I want to now see 5 and they're now going to make a six. Okay. Why? Very successful. So what is it that's going to get mom and dad or the most difficult demographics, boys under 25, out of the house and into the movie theater? And it's a very difficult process, the marketability, because you need to peak some, there's got to be some emotion, there's got to be some reason that you're going to get off that sofa. And it may be cold out, it may be horrible weather, and it's expensive to get yourself out of, the, out of your house and into a theater. And at the same time, you're now going to, and I know this sounds simple, but you're now going to a big room and you're going to watch a movie in the dark with, with nobody you know. But yet you're going to share with those people you don't know, whether it's sadness or fun or some emotion, which is really, really important because what is it inside of you that made you want to go to that picture? And it's just something, I don't have the answer all the time, but it's something to think about. And by the way, it's also important to think about who, well, let me ask a question. Who's been to a movie in the last two months, two, two weeks? Okay, and you saw what? Okay, and the great guy, and who did you go with? Did you go with another girl? Did you go with a guy? Who'd you go with? A guy. And was it your decision that you wanted to see the great Gatsby, or was it his decision? Correct. <laughs> it was your decision, because if I'm, if I'm the guy, and I'm thinking, Great Gatsby, who cares? I don't want to see Great Gatsby, I want to see Star Trek. Who else went to the movie recently? What did you see? What did you see? And, and who did you go with? Alone. Why? No one would go with you? <laughs> I need somebody. Who went to the movie with somebody? Yes, sir. To see Great Gatsby. It was your idea to see Great Gatsby. You had to convince your mother to go. She said, and why did you want to see it? So you read the original book, book-based property. Obviously, we know it's a remake. It's been done before. So Leonardo DiCaprio, you didn't care. You just went because it was a book that you're familiar with. The the glamour 
and the big production value, and were you entertained? Good. Who else saw something besides The Great Gatsby? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how old are your children? And how did they learn about the movie? Did they see a TV commercial? Did they see... You saw a trailer in the movie theater. So that is a very, very good example of what I call the nag factor. And I'm not sure that translates well, but the nag factor is your kids will not, relentlessly saying, mom, dad, I want to see this movie. Mom, dad, I want to see this movie. And you go because you want them to stop bothering you. So in that situation, the kids obviously were made the decision to see the movie. Anybody else want to share an experience of who made the decision? Yes, sir. You have your hand like this. Great. And who did you go with? Your whole class went. Five people. And girls or guys? Both. And did you go and were you entertained? Yeah. You liked the movie? Well, yeah. Okay. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that depending upon the, who the movie appeals to and who really makes that decision to go. So for example, and the best example I can come across is Sex in the City. So a female skewed movie like Sex in the City, one of the reasons it's so successful is women love to have girls night out, love to go to the movies together. Let's go see Sex in the City. Let's go see Prada. And you're going to see in the future more of these what I call female skewed pictures because they are an audience that if you hit it right, they will, not only will they see it once, but they will actually take another group and they'll see it again. And then of course, what I call your date movie. Um, who here likes horror movies, whether it's paranormal or insidious? Anybody seen any of these, any movies? Yes, sir. And who did you go with? Your friend, guys or girls? Guys. And were you all scared? Not really. Usually what happens on those kind of movies, those are your typical date movies because a guy wants to take a girl and hopefully she gets scared and hopefully she jumps on him, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So those are what I call your date movies. So in America, and just generally speaking, the primary movie going demographic age is 24 to 39, which is about 24% of the movie going public. And then the 18 to 24 is another 19%. So what about old people like me, us, who's ever in this audience? So what I call the older demographics. What you're going to see too is this, the demographics for the, let's call it 45 plus, is going to, you're going to see more movies that are aimed at that demographic. Now, that demographic is not like kids. If, when the kids want to see a movie, when you get their interest, they want to see it on Friday night. They want to see it right away. And that's why what sometimes, usually with these horror movies, they have a huge Friday night opening, and then the Saturday night decreases because everybody that really wanted to see it saw it on Friday night. But the older demographics, people like me and others in the audience, we will get to the movie. We may not get there on the first weekend. We may not get there on the second weekend. But we're consistent because we're slow. Okay, but we get there. Okay. And I think you will find that there'll be many more movies made in this demographics. So again, 
what kind of movie you're going to go see or what it is you want to see really is going to vary. Some people want to go see, okay, Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, you're going to go see any movie they're in, maybe. Or in Europe especially, the director is almost as important as the stars in the movie. So in, in, in France, in Italy, which are, let's call it sophisticated European countries, the director is very, very important. And sometimes the director is actually promoted more than the actual cast. So, I don't want to, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about independent financing. Now, if you have a movie that you're going to make, that a studio wants to make, it's very simple. You go to the studio, you make a distribution deal, and they write a check, and they make the movie. Very simple. It's a one check stop, I call it. Now, if you're trying to make the movie independently, which means, again, movies that are not made by a studio, that's a very complicated process. And what happens is, so for example, we just all came from the Cannes Film Festival. So three times a year, there are major film markets. And it's like any other market. Everybody has their booth, and there's buyers from all over the world. There's independent distributors through in every country of the world that need product. And they can't get the studio product because the studio distributes their product. They have their own operations in every major city and country in the world. So there are independent companies that need product. So we go to, and, and, and the circuit is very simple. In January, it's Berlin. Now Berlin, which is in February, I do not recommend anybody going other than because of the weather, but be that as it may, in, in Berlin, it's a film festival and it's a film market. And there's a big difference between the two. You know, a film market is we're there to sell movies. A film festival screens movies in or out of competition, trying to get either distribution or they're trying to, what happens is sometimes you will launch a movie in Berlin or can, and then you will, what I call, release the picture theatrically throughout Europe. The second major film festival and market is Cannes. And Cannes is really, for the film side, is like the Olympics. Um, it is the major event throughout the world. And there, everybody is bringing, hopefully, their best product for not only the film festival, but for the film market. And then we move into November in Los Angeles called the American Film Market, which is just a market. It is not a festival. So today, there is literally a film festival every day of the year somewhere. Every day. So movies can screen forever in film festivals. But the ones that really make a difference are Berlin, Cannes, Venice. And then in America, the two major North American festivals are Sundance and Toronto. So what really is, what's challenging today about this business? That's a really hard business. It's a very difficult business, especially in, whether it's an independent or a studio, because mo, mo, a, a majority of movies lose money. And when I say that, people look at me like, why would you say that? Because it's true. Okay. So certain movies are going to lose money. Certain movies are what I call going to break even. And then hopefully on this side, some movies are going to make money. And the only way that you can do this right is you need to have a portfolio mentality. And I don't know if I'll explain what that means. That means you need to make as many pictures as you can 
so that you, you increase your odds of a success. And it's a portfolio analysis. And whether it's a studio or whether it's an independent, it's the same analysis. You need to try and make as many movies as you can. Now, we talked about, so one of the so some of the challenges is, so what is challenging the business today? Well, of course, I mentioned it. So since most of you have been downloading movies illegally, um, piracy. It's a real problem. And it ruined the music business. The music business is, because I came from the music business, the music business in, in the world as we once knew it is gone. Okay? My, every time I buy a CD, my kids yell at me. Dad, what's wrong with you? Nobody buys CDs anymore. You could go download it from, from iTunes. You don't need to, well, I like my CD. Dad, no more CDs. So there is this whole digital mentality revolution that is taking place. And that is causing a big decrease in the number of DVDs that are sold throughout the world. So what else is, pro what other problems do we have? Production costs are rising. Production costs, it's expensive to make a movie. I mean, I was talking to somebody here before we started and I said they were making a movie and I said, how much? And they said, it's costing $50,000. I'm going, wow, fantastic, fantastic. Now, the average cost of a movie these days, you know, can be anywhere, if it depends if you're a studio. I mean, the marketing costs can be $150 million if you're a studio. Just the marketing costs alone can be an exorbitant amount of money. So again, what's also causing some challenges, and I touched on it briefly, was this local language business. Because the local language movies, there was a time recently, within the last five years, we could not sell an English language movie in Japan. Because the Japanese box office was so dominated by its local language movies. And now, hopefully, uh, that's changing a bit. So we'll see how that goes. So the independent model, let me go back to that a bit. The independent model is we go to one of these film markets, we sell the movie, and when I say we sell the movie, hi, Mr. Buyer in Italy, Here's the script, here's the director, we have this cast members, the movie's going to cost a certain amount of money, of which most everybody lies, and they know it, but that's okay. And we say, Mr. Buyer, do you have interest in acquiring all rights for this? When I say all rights, what does that mean for Italy? So they have the right to exploit this movie on theatrical, video, TV, video on demand, and all revenue streams in that particular territory. And we try and sell as much as possible. And that's called a pre-sale. So we take, at the end of a market, we take the pre-sales, and we add them all up, and then we go to a bank, and the bank will loan us money against those contracts. So what does that mean? So, if we go and we've sold $10 million in all the territories of the world, a senior lender may loan us $8 million. And that's $8 million now towards the production costs. The second thing that's considered is that you want to shoot all of your movies in some location, in some jurisdiction, in some country that will give you a subsidies or tax benefits. And it's very, very important. Whether you're shooting a movie in Louisiana, or you're shooting a movie in France, or it's a French-Canadian co-production, or you're shooting a movie in Canada, where you can receive what's called soft money, up to 40% in soft money, which is money you don't pay back, which goes against reducing the negative cost. So now we have We've sold $10 million in movies, and by the way, our estimates show, oh, we didn't sell certain countries, 
because you didn't sell out. So we still have $5 million of unsold territories. A bank will loan money against those unsold territories, which is called mezzanine or gap financing. So now we've got our pre-sales. We've got a bank loaning against our unsold rights. We've now been able to get 20 or 30% of the negative from soft money where we, because we've shot in a particular jurisdiction or country. Uh, but you know what? We're still missing money. We're still missing 10, 15, 20% of the cost of the movie. Where are we going to get it? That money is called equity. And whether, and it's the same, it, equity means the same thing whether it's the movie business or it's the refrigerator business or any business. It's the riskiest money and it's money that is at the bottom of the water, at the bottom of the chain and that is the money that has the most risk attached to it. But everybody at the moment, this is a really good time for producers. This is a really good time because there is a lot of money or equity available to make independent movies. So, but wait, Jerry, you just said movies lose money and a lot of them break even. Why is there so much money around? What's, what's the definition of Hollywood? Depends on who you are. Is it about the glamour? Is it about, you know, going to the premiere? Or is it show business? It has to be, it's a business. And it has to be run like a business. So, there's, with the U.S. stock market up, with real estate prices on the rise, with pulling ourselves out of the 2008-2009 worldwide recession, there seems to be a lot of what's, whether it's hedge funds, whether it's high net worth individuals, or other monies available to finance independent production. So if you're a producer, this is a really good time for you because there's actually significant financing available throughout the world. So where, where, where's this business going? What, what, what are we really looking at? What, what's changing the way we conventionally or historically have viewed the business? What's changing is the way consumers want to access content. It's all about how are you going to access and view content. Because what's happening in America and a number of other countries is what I call windows of distribution. What do I mean by that term? It's conventional. A movie sometimes will start in a movie theater. It will then go on DVD. You'll then see it on maybe pay television. You'll see it also involved, or iTunes will have it for sale. So what's happening is that the digital explosion, and this is around the world, is really starting to make up for and supplement the decrease in DVD revenue. And What's happening in America, and it really hasn't really caught on yet to certain other countries, where a movie may, on the, and by the way, there's always a window. So if a movie's in a theater, you won't see it on DVD until maybe four or six months later. So each media has its own call, window of exploitation, its own segment in terms of how long you, you'll be able to watch it there. What's happening is because of the digital revolution, movies are now, the windows are changing, there's a lot of experimentation about maybe we release a movie in one or two screens and then it's available on video on demand depending upon the country and how much broadband there is in that particular country. And so there's a lot of experimentation about how a consumer for the future is going to access content. Now, I'm not a believer. I don't really want to watch a movie on my iPhone, okay? But there are people that will, 
Okay? There are people that are going to watch a movie on their computer. They're going to watch it on their laptop. They're going to watch it on their iPad. So this is all to be determined, but it's really a digital re revolution. And for the film business, it's a very good thing. So I think I've spoken enough. Um, a little bit about the business, a little bit about understanding about what this business is. Um, who would like to, any questions that I, I'll be happy to answer, anything, most anything. Yes, sir. Yes. The big problem is that the films that are on Netflix are not accessible in Eastern Europe, the place of last year. I mean, I would be happy to pay per view and in this way to sort of conquer piracy that exists. But in a sense, that I feel that Hollywood, although it acts like a police force, also uh, sometimes promoting or in default inadvertently uh, sort of conjuring and causing this piracy because a lot of well, it's a really good question because whether it's Netflix, which is now operating in you know, Latin America, UK, Scandinavia, uh, and they compete directly with Amazon's Love Film, which is in all those countries as well as Germany, um, certain movies, it's very difficult for Netflix, they have to go into those territories and make a deal with that particular distributor for all of their movies under what's called a so-called output arrangement. And it's sometimes, like in America, you're only, even in America on Netflix, only certain student companies have an output deal. You can't get Sony, Warner Brothers, Fox, current movies on Netflix in America. Right, you, but, you have, but you have a number of great Sundance films, let's say you're talking about Sundance, right? So Netflix can distribute those. Yes. Yes. If you want to see some, like, because the, the uh, access to American films, at least in last year, is, is rather shallow at best. You know? Well, well every, you're, 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 you are right, okay? But that's not going to change overnight. That's going to take some time. And Netflix, uh, on, the, on the countries that it has entered, has become very, very successful. But what movies that are available to Netflix is really a specific negotiation with that particular distributor in that territory. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, sure. but that's the reality. The issue of the access is a more complicated one. It's a, it's, it's the, the issue, Netflix is, you know, has to be available, is available only in certain countries of the world. And it's not going to be available everywhere every, all the time. So they're rolling out in a very methodical manner. So you're not going to find every movie available on Netflix. But what's, what's, from what I know about Netflix, and I am no expert on Netflix, but 75, at least I believe 60 to 75 percent of the viewing on Netflix is television series. So for example, television series, they're always usually, thank you, uh, a year behind. So when I want to go watch Catch Up and when it's Downtown Abbey or Breaking Bad, you can go to Netflix and most of the time you can catch up and watch all of the prior, ser all of the prior series for that, those particular years. So a sub substantial majority of Netflix's customers are what's called TV binging. Now, they just produced a series, I think it was 13 hour series of House of Cards. And as opposed to the conventional television where you'd be able to watch one and then week two you would watch another one, they made all 13 available immediately. And people are sitting there really 
watching all of them at once. And that term is called TV binge, it's called binging. And um, Netflix, they're the best. They're very, very, and I think Netflix, the future of subscription VOD is um, where this business is gonna, is moving towards. Yes, sir. Exporting European movies, or let's call it local language movies, because it's everywhere out there, is a very, very difficult. So take America. Americans don't like subtitles. They don't really, they've never embraced the concept of reading a subtitle. And it was tried a couple times where they took a French movie and they tried to dub it into English, and that didn't really work. So exporting movies is sometimes difficult. Now, can a French, now, of course, there's the exception. Anybody here see The Intouchables last year, the French movie? Yeah. That movie did 10 million admissions in Germany, and some huge number, it was a gigantic, hit throughout the world and it did, it was, I think it was one of the biggest French movies in America in a really long time. But those examples of a movie that has that kind of worldwide acceptance are very rare. So can you take German movies and go into, into America? Hard. Can you take French movies and go into Germany? Not easy. Um, so again, it's very, and can you take, you know, Russian CIS movies and move them around the world? Sometimes. It's really, again, a lot of the time when you can do that is really very director driven. It's a very well known director and you will be able to do some business, but generally speaking, that proposition is difficult. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I mean, the bigger tentpole movies, or most of them have significant special effects in them. Um, you can't make a movie and see what we see today without visual effects. Well, that's again something I, I've touched on at the beginning. Here we have the tension between art and commerce. Okay, do you want to make an, a picture for purposes of art, or do we want to make a movie for purposes of commerce? Okay, and there is this tension. I mean, that tension doesn't exist at Warner Brothers or at a studio, and it doesn't exist you know, in the space that I occupy because we're looking to make commercial movies for at least one demo, at least one quadrant, if not more. Um, so I don't really have an answer. There is really no cut and dry answer for that question. Um, it's just really an issue of what's going to make that movie work throughout the world. Yes, ma'am. I think you're going to see, and what we continue to see, is the Hollywood studios are focusing on the tentpole, big, extravagant pictures. That's their focus. 
Um, one or two of the studios still have what's called these specialized divisions where they are taking obviously the smaller movies, whether it's Sony Classics, which is owned by Sony Corporation, or whether it's Fox Searchlight, which is owned by Fox Studios. But what we've seen happen is at least three of those specialized divisions within the last five years, last four years, have been closed. Because it's a very, that too is a very difficult business. It's a very challenging business. But when you get it right, and you can get it right, these are, these are cheaper movies, they're less expensive, and here, perfect example. Anybody here see a Best Exotic Marigold Hotel? Okay, I assume anybody raising their hand is probably over 40. Okay, I would assume. So there's an example of a movie that costs $7 million to make. Um, obviously, with Judy Dench and the audience was obviously for a much older demographics. Uh, I'm going off of memory here, but I believe the movie did close to, if not more than a $100 million box office and was a huge success. Huge. Now again, you're, and those are the kind of studies in, in that you're going to see you know, in the future. Okay? where you can make a movie for that specific time, for that specific demographic, and, and, and have it be successful. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have um, already understood that this would require a problematic business to win it to make it a movie. Problematic? Mm -hmm. oh, I think we should ask our co-chairman. Yeah, right. Serge, is this a problematic business in making a movie? <laughs> it's simple. Do you love it? Do you love it? What's your intention? Not every day, no. Not every day. But yes, I love the business. And when you do get it right, and when you do watch a movie that you've been involved in for the last year and a half, because that's what this process is. I mean, if we, by the time you're done getting the movie developed and produced and ready, ready for a consumer, you're talking about a year to a year and a half of your life, if not more. And yes, is it a thrill to you know, be involved in a movie that is accepted and is successful? Absolutely, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but that said, you know, it's, the business is not for the faint of heart. I don't know if anybody knows what I mean by that expression. It is a business with executives that are very smart, very aggressive, can be very challenging, um, and, it's, and it's very labor intensive. There's no such thing as you're ever off duty. You're never off duty. You were on, you have to be available all the time. There's no such thing as, oh, it's Saturday afternoon. Um, I can tell you for myself, um, the two months leading up to Cannes, when we were looking for movies to get involved in so that we would have a picture or two to sell new pictures in Cannes, I was probably obviously going to work on a normal day. Literally on the weekend, I was probably reading between four and five scripts every weekend. So off duty, no. Uh, it is for, it's a business that um, it's not scientific. It is, you know, a lot of it, it's from your gut and what you feel. Um, and it's what kind of experience you have and that hopefully Two plus two equals four. Yes, sir, again. Uh, just quickly back to that, you talked about specialized subdivisions. And uh, what, what actually the problem with that model is? Because, I mean, it's closer to European model. I, when you, like, I remember there was a problem on Bonkish, which is a subdivision. Correct, which they shut down. Well, Memento was a pickup. Uh, Memento actually 
I remember, because I was, where was I? I think I was at Disney at the time. And I remember there was a screen, I was a buyer. And I remember screening this movie, Memento. And again, this is a proud movie that very few people in this room will remember. And I remember watching the movie and watching it and watching it. And it wasn't for us. I ended up buying it for, I think, South Africa and Australia. Um, but these, these divisions were very, very challenging. And they're very challenging because they are capital intensive. Um, they're very, very awards driven divisions. Um, and when you have a movie like that, uh, it's very, very labor intensive, expensive. And sometimes, you know, it's if a studio or has a certain amount of capital available, they may not want to deploy that capital in those type of pictures. Yes, ma'am. Um, I cannot hear you. Can you speak? What's the difference? Is it is are the are the operations of the of the two types of movies different? Oh, if you, yes, what you do not want to do now, I understand. Uh, if you're an independent, if you are making independent movies, our wish and goal is to sell our movie to a studio. That's the, I, I mean, that's sort of hitting the gold, the gold ring. We want to, we, in fact, we have a movie now that we have a studio very interested in. Um, that is really what we all strive for. It's, it's difficult. Um, studios are not really acquiring that many independent movies until they actually screen them. And that's where all the buyers go to Sundance and Toronto and Cannes and look for pictures to acquire. Now, this particular Cannes, which has not been, is that at least I'm aware of six pictures were bought for the US by various companies, which is a record. So again, there's still a huge appetite for, I mean, independent movies are gonna always, always survive. They may take on different forms. They may take on different price points. But the one thing you need, everyone should un understand about an independent movie, the worldwide revenue has to exceed the budget of the movie. So what do I mean by that? That means that in doing your calculation, and if a movie's gonna cost $5, hopefully, we're gonna be able to get eight to $10 from it after we've sold the movie throughout the world. And there's no real science to this. Sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. So that's really the advice I can give. But let me just talk about that one real quick about in terms of advice. So people always ask me, so what advice can you give? I can give a little something. but number, number one, go to the movies. You need to see as many movies as you can. And you need to pay attention as to why you went to that movie how you got to that movie, and were you satisfied with what you saw? And I'm talking about not just seeing, you know, Spider-Man or Iron Man. I'm talking about seeing as much and all the types of movies as you can. So that you have a really understanding of the kind of what's working and what's not working in different throughout the world. Number two, you got to follow your dreams. You can't, don't take no for an answer. You really need to push and you need to be aggressive and you need to try and do everything in your power to make, to have your dreams become a reality. And I know that's very easy for me to sit here and, and, and say, but believe me, it's very doable. 
Any other last questions? It's time for me. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very valuable time. Thank you. Oh, hi. I get flowers? Great. Yep. Got it's a pleasure. Okay.